We're now going to move into our first farmer panel. Um, so I'd like to invite Anne Kirk, who will be moderating this one. Anne is on the MOA board and has a small organic farm near Sanford. She also works as the cereal crop specialist for Imagine Agriculture. Our farmers are Kevin Nickel, Jonah Leitenwas, Joseph Gardner, and Brooks White, who will be telling us more about their farms and how they're using cover crops in their management. Okay, so for the first cover cropping panel, uh, we have Farmers representing three farms. We'll start with a presentation from each yeah, farmer about their operation and how they use cover crops. And then I will be asking the panel some questions, and then we'll end with some questions from the audience. Uh, so first I'd like to call up um, Kevin and Jonah. Uh, they, they farm about 2,300 acres in the Red River Valley, a few miles north of Altona. Uh, they seeded their first field of tillageradish in, in 2015 after wheat and have now grown cover crops on about two-thirds of their acres for the past two years. So we'll let Jonah take care of the auto steer here. Can't get our PowerPoint to work. Okay. <laughs> well, that's uh, unfortunate. So then when I get to parts that said and it looked like this, then I'll uh, have to modify it. Well, I would like to say right off the bat that uh, I don't consider myself to have enough knowledge on any subject uh, to be giving a presentation, let alone be on a panel, but uh, maybe sometimes it's important to hear from the rookies too. So we're what I guess you'd call non-organic, somewhat unconventional farmers. We're trying very hard to reduce our hours on the sprayer and increase them on the seeder. As Anne said, we are here north of Altona, closer to the village of Rosenfeld. So Rosenfeld is located right on Highway 14, and our farm extends no further than a mile and a half south, south and a mile and a half north of that highway and no further than a mile east and four miles west. So this is an important distinction of our farm because not only does it afford us to have the convenience of farming close to home, it also gives the rest of the world the opportunity to drive by and see exactly what we're doing on almost half of our land. So you can imagine our trepidation when trying something new, everybody gets to see. Our soils are heavy clay and clay loam. The land is flat. And in the last 30 years, wet soils and surface drainage issues have been more the rule than the exception. The last three years, up until last month notwithstanding, it has traditionally been and continues to be a heavy tillage and high crop or high crop inputs area, but we're attempting to buck those trends. Throughout our history, we've grown a wide assortment of crops, including sugar beets and corn and other rural crops, but in more recent years have settled on a three-year rotation of spring wheat, canola, and soybeans a rotation that we are hoping to expand to create more diversity. And we do dabble in a few others. We have no livestock other than our underground herd of soil organisms and some yard-bound pigs and chickens for our own use. May they digest in peace. <laughs> so I grew up on our family farm and after getting my ag degree in 1989, started farming with my dad in earnest, right on the heels of the 88 drought. In those years, seeing fields going with dust was commonplace, something my dad and I despised. So this was always a huge consideration whenever we did a field operation of any sort. How vulnerable are we making the soil? So soil care and protection have been a long-held value for me, but until I discovered the soil health movement a few years ago, the only tools I knew to manage that realm were crop rotation and reduced tillage. How exciting it's been to have this whole world of soil, bi soil biology nurture open up and to add other tools to the kit, including cover crops. So on the topics, topic of cover crops specifically, as Anne said, in 2015, after wheat harvest and an inch and a half of rain, we seeded our first field of tillage, tillage radish at the end of August with our John Deere 1830 hodron, our main seeding tool. This is what they looked like at the end of September. So it was, we got, a, we got a nice catch, and things were looking really quite good. And then I had a picture of, this is what they looked like a month later, and it was a picture of a guy holding a 
big massive radish, which of course wasn't true. We got we got decent carrots out of them, which we were happy with. Twenty sixteen was an incredibly wet year for us throughout the growing season. We thought it would be great to get clover going in a canola field during the growing season so that the clover could take root and get a head start and then once the canola was harvested, the canola could, or clover could take off and flourish. That year we were getting rain like every other day it seemed. So at the tail end of harvest, or at the tail end of bloom, we flew on this radish uh, clover mix and um, by the time we came to harvest, even though we had lots of rain up until that point, there was no clover to be seen anywhere, probably due to lack of light. Uh, that fall was generally too wet to do much of anything else. We tried spreading some radish and we put peas in a, in a spinner spreader and did a light deep till and harrowing and we got a decent stand, but nothing compared to what our seer gave us the year before. 2017 was dry and we did nothing. In 2018, we tried the clover thing again in canola, only this time we did it earlier, um, after herbicide and prior to ground cover and bolting. And we actually got some rain and got a nice catch of clover, but then it turned dry and hot and there was no clover to be seen again. Um, that fall, we were fortunate to get a rain again and that's always the thing, when you're going into fall and the ground is dry and it's hard and you think, well, is there gonna be any point to doing a cover crop? And then in these last couple of years, we have gotten a rain, so we've jumped on it. So uh, last year we did a mixture of oat pea flax and oat flax radish on all our canola acres. And lo and behold, they took, and we actually got pretty nice growth out of them. We didn't do anything on our wheat land, which was unfortunate because it just sat there idle all year or for the balance of the fall with only a few volunteer strips. We also seeded barley into um, an early soybean field that we harvested. And uh, we also put some oats in there beside the barley, some strips to see which uh, grass would do better uh, both with growth and with uh, frost tolerance, and barley actually seemed to win on both counts. Um, the, we, we had some pretty decent frosts, and the barley took it quite well while the oats just just withered. So that was interesting to see, because we'd actually been told by a few people that it would be the opposite. Um, one of the questions I always have when we have these cover crops growing in the field is what's this going to look like next spring? Can we get too much growth? Well, up until last year, um, like we did have we had some really nice, you know, oats that are were well tillered, and, um, some decent peas and some decent flax. And when it came to spring and we were seeding, uh, you could barely see that there was anything there at all. So obviously that that changes at some point, and that's what we're anticipating this year, because this year we have done the same sort of program on our canola stubble, but on our wheat stubble, we put in uh, a mixture of radish, which I know is a bad idea, and we're gonna get away from it. Flea beetles decimated most of it. A few did survive, um, but uh, canary seed was the thing that, that uh, was the main crop in most of our wheat stubble, and we've got like significant growth out of that in a zero-till wheat stubble situation. And I have to say that I am somewhat nervous about that for how the spring is going to be. But um, we have yet to uh, yet to see how that goes. Uh, a couple of other things that we did that just in the interest of diversity was a uh, a um, intercrop experiment on 40 acres of soybeans where we did uh, 40 acres, 10 pounds of flax with non-GMO soybeans beside 40 acres of just straight soybeans. Um, that's another talk. I would not recommend it, but uh, it actually turned out okay. And we also had on one of our small fields, we had a feed crop of uh, 
Then we have either barley and oats and wheat, and then flax and peas. Um, this is to feed our massive six head hog herd and sell it to some other neighbors who have expressed an interest. But we added a little leftover phosphorus to it. But other than that, we didn't add any nitrogen. But we didn't spray it with anything. Of, we did a little pre heart pre emerge roundup, but after that, we didn't spray it. And uh, to our surprise, it yielded like over 80 bushels an acre using a 48 pound bushel, which was it was on soybean land, but we just weren't expecting that kind of yield. So um, that's what all I have. So thanks for your interest. Thank you. So our next uh, presenter is Brooks White. So Brooks and Jen White, along with their two young children, own and operate borderland agriculture in the extreme southwestern corner of Manitoba. They focus on regenerative agriculture by incorporating bison into a highly diverse cropping system. And in 2019, 90% of their annual production uh, included the use of cover crops, companion crops, uh, and intercrops. And in 2018, they were recognized in Canada's Outstanding Young Farmers Program. Uh, my presentation worked. So I didn't make any notes. So, yeah, I guess that's enough of an intro. Um, so, the Pearson Lyleson area, for those who are familiar with it, is where we farm. Um, extreme southwest corner, when I say that, I mean extreme southwest, so we're land borders on North Dakota and so on, Saskatchewan. We farm in the wettest part of Manitoba. Um, no, sorry, the driest part of Manitoba. No, no, it's the wettest part of Manitoba again. So, does that sound familiar to anybody? Um, we kind of have this, this issue with our water cycle. And I think a lot of what we're trying to do on our farm is address what we can control with this water cycle. So 1999 was the year I started farming, and first year back on the farm, as many of you probably remember, we, on our farm at least, we did not see a single acre on our farm. We've had three more years of that on our farm. And so it was in years later, looking back on some of these photos, and, and um, this one really stood out for me. You can see where it's green in the bottom. A live plant is growing and there's no standing water on the same elevation. So it was showing the effect of a live plant could have on water infiltration. And it was in these years following this, some of these real wet cycles through the mid late 2000s that we started to experiment with cover crops. And I guess we didn't know they were cover crops or think of the benefits they were having as cover crops. We just were growing them on these fields that were too wet to seed to a cash crop. We we're growing them as an uh, emergency feed source for our livestock. And so, in, a, in an attempt to try to feed our animals, we kind of stumbled in years later of seeing the benefits that these cover crops were having on the soil. And how, in the years following, those wettest fields we had turned into the first fields we could get on. And we could see it was all to do with our water filtration rates. Now, zero till had been a part of the farm since the early 1980s. And Dad uh, was really a leader in, in moving to the till, but it wasn't enough and we, we knew we had to make some changes to the farm. We had to create a new view on the way we looked at agriculture. And we really had to step back, look at all these little pieces that we were kind of stumbling on and try to figure out how they all really fit together and what that puzzle was gonna look like. And we had to take that degenerative model that had happened for so long. My dad really did move along and turn into a sustainable farm. We needed to take it to the next level and to try to figure out how we were gonna regenerate that soil and put it to work for us. And so, after three years of extreme dry weather, and the very first rainfall event we had in the spring, I think June 8th, and I was driving home that night, if this video will work, we had a, over an inch rain in 15 minutes. This is our first rainfall event for the spring, coming off of a dry year prior. And you can see all the water on this field, on the headland, yet out in the distance, off of the, the 100 feet headland, there's no water laying in the field. And it just hit home of what was happening in the field. I'm trying to step back and observe what was happening. And it was, it's purely a headland issue that we all deal with. And the, uh, it's just showing there's no water infiltration happening here. So we knew there's a problem on the headland. All the water that came from that one inch rain, and the rest of the field was absorbed. But that headland all ran off and went to this one low spot in the field. 
and it's not there. And that is not a water in us, it's June 8th, and it's still has been growing, 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 because all the water keeps running off of that headband. So that's one of the target areas we had in our farm this year. What can we do with areas like that? We don't need to necessarily seed that entire field to a cover crop, but why not seed that headland? And take the headland out of production from what's happening with the rest of the field and put it into a cover crop and try to alleviate that issue of water infiltration action. After that same rainfall event, another mile up the road, another field where we had made a change last year. One change was putting a cover crop in the ground after a harvest, so after rye harvest. On the bottom, there's no water laying in the field. And the other two fields, were, all three pictures were taken from the same spot on the road. And when I looked around, it saw the same waterway going across three fields. So that one work there. So on the bottom, there's no water laying in the field, and on the top two, there's water laying there. The only difference on all three of these no-till fields was that we had included a cover crop last fall after rye harvest, and in this spring, we allowed that cover crop, which had rye in it, to grow all spring before we seeded into it, to the point where it was right before heading. And after that first rainfall event, that one year making a change and improved water filtration and captured that water. Now how we're using cover crops on our farm is really specific to our needs in our grazing program. And because we operate a, a mixed grain farm, so we're about 7,000 acres total on our farm, 5,000 is annual production, but we have 2,000 acres of perennials as well. We're, we're working the perennials through different areas of the farm. We're grazing all year round with our bison, so we're not feeding them in the winter, we're trying to graze them as much as we can through the year. These cover crops play a really important role for us in our grazing plans. So we sit down and make a grazing plan, and any time through the year where we need to fill a gap in our grazing plan, we can utilize a cover crop. And so for example, this year where we had a real dry season and our perennials were not regrowing, we needed to allow adequate rest for our perennials. And if we went back in too early this year, we weren't going to provide the adequate rest those perennials needed, so we could pull out of the perennials and we could jump into a cover crop to try to preserve the life of those perennials until they had the proper time to recover. So sitting down and having a plan, having cover crop fields designated for that purpose, we can pull it in the summer. If our perennials are recovering fast enough, we can go into those cover crops in the fall or winter months instead. And one, for example, here we didn't use it all two years ago, we carried it right through the winter and grazed the fall and spring. And we're including <coughs> quite often biannuals or even perennials in these mixes so we have something there to start growing again in that spring right away. And we're using these as a way to jumpstart some of these fields. We're transitioning from conventional high input fields into a lower input um, regenerative field. And so taking a field, no till, and then conventionally farm, seeding to a full season cover, grazing it intensively with the bison in an effort to get as much of that back into the soil as we can and try to jumpstart the biology. And it's amazing how fast we can really see the improvements that can happen from this. And after even one year of making a change, we see the insects starting to come back. And we see the nutrients cycling fast and, and the grass going right back to the manure and breaking that down. And seeing the soil structure improve where we can get that water infiltration that we need. And digging in there and finding, you know, upwards of seven earthworms in every spadeful. Yet you know, we walk across the field to a motor crop canola field and the dirt just falls apart in our hands. I say dirt compared to this soil because that's really what it ultimately was. There was no soil structure at all, it just fell apart. And uh, that's after making only one year change with a full season cover crop. To the point where you can see the earthworms channeling all the way down into the subsoil. And some of the examples we, you know, with water infiltration that we've seen as this picture was taken, we had an inch and a half of rain that night and first thing in the morning, because that live cover crop is growing, we can go up there and we can be seeding. And that's just a picture of that same field it was seeded into an existing cover crop, so it was a double cover crop, crop if that makes sense. And we come back later in the fall and we graze that off. And sometimes we graze early enough like in July, we'll get a regrowth out of those cover crops if we include the right species. And always trying to leave enough residue in these cover crops, we're not taking everything. We really learned, I, I really like this, this uh, 
the same, but you can't throw on cover valves and expect miracles because there's a lot to put into it and think about and how to make it part of your system and what's going to work for you. And uh, there's no one recipe out there. One of the ways we're doing it is, is what we call our field art. And taking 160 acre fields and splitting them up and seeding them in strips. And then grazing with the bison. So the bison are getting four acres at a time in here and they're getting two acres of a full season cover crop and two acres of a corn berry Dutch mix. And we're moving them along through this. So it gives the animals a diverse diet. So not only we're we trying to address the issues in our soil, but also address um, how to get the maximum performance out of our animals. And these animals were able to get to a uh, finishing weight grazing in a field like this and ship from straight to market. And then next year we'll alternate that field and we'll swap cover crop and corn patch. And we really have an advantage with us, we call it the bison advantage that we're using because these guys really are natural winter grazers and they'll dig through the snow, no problem. And I think we need to look at cover crops maybe in a way that Scott's going to get into more with, with uh, relays and companions and how we can get things started earlier in the season rather than trying to just focus on seeding them after a cash crop. Sunflowers and clover, this has a nine species mix in between our sunflower rows and corn and berry veg, I'm sure it'll probably touch on as well. It works really well for us. I will wrap it up there. We've seen some really vast improvements in, um, you know, in our, in our on-farm trials, our soil year on these challenge, you know, the, the, most microbial activity we found in our soil on these challenges after cover crops. Best water filtration we've reached we've seen is after cover crops. And we've seen fields of corn where after a number of years of cover cropping, we add fertilizer back into our system and we've lost yield in corn instead of gaining yield. So <coughs> I'll leave it at that. Move on. <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, they started the holistic management when it came through. Um, I believe Blaine Jurgis down here in the front was one of their mentors, which has come full circle because I'm involved with the General Mills Regenerative Ag Program and Blaine is <laughs> now a mentor of mine. Um, the first cover crop, I couldn't remember exactly. It was 2011, 12, or 13. But anyway, it was a massive, massive success. I went out after a fall rye crop before I'd ever heard of soil health. I just wanted to put some seeds in the ground and see if we could get a viable forage for cattle, and it was spectacular. Um, and we uh, continued to, uh, to to do fall seed cover crops, trying to get similar results. Um, spoiler alert: we, other than the first year we tried it, basically we weren't getting very good results at all. It was always either a factor of not enough sunlight, not enough moisture, and if you're a plant that is a bad, bad combination. Um, so in 2017, we started incorporating forages and intercrops into our rotation. And in 2018, we are full on regenerative. So these are cash crops. I put cash in rotations because if you're growing crops, you should make money on all of them, whether that's they go back to the soil and, and improve resilience. But these are the crops that we sell to make money. Um, so you can see millets, uh, soybeans, peas, forage peas, oats, buckwheat, fall rye, uh, canola, uh, and then we're actually doing a number of grasses this year and corn, like I mentioned. Uh, so these are the cover crops that we grow, that we try to incorporate. Um, basically, I, I separated up the, uh, the black is cool season, the red is warm season, but it's just trying to get that diversity of plant species. This is us mixing up, a, uh, the picture is us mixing up a 15-way mix, our full season cover. Um, not pictured it is my dad and I about to kill each other. <laughs> it's as disorganized as it looks, absolutely. <laughs> um, but I, what I should say about cover crops, I should touch on again. Um, if you're just getting into cover crop and your soil health, and you got, I, I would suggest highly that if you were going to start, pull some seed out of your bin, sow it. Don't necessarily get hung up on the need warm season, cool season, because eight years out of ten, you're going to get nothing. So you might as well not spend money on the seed. Um, so we're actually mo we're moving away. This year, I think we saw 40 acres of uh, fall seed covers. That the, it was mostly a radish blend that the food yields took it all. But basically, our focus now is relay cropping and intercropping with perennials. So we get that head start in season. So when our cash crop is off, that we can uh, uh, we've already got a, a running start. So this is the opportunities that I see with uh, regenerative egg. Obviously carbon sequestration. Um, uh, the soil resiliency obviously comes with it. Uh, reliable feed source. If we're growing more plants and we have an end use, which is our livestock, uh, every, the more plants we can grow, the more forage that we have. Uh, obviously reduced in inputs, um, the intercrop synergy. Uh, I, won't, I won't get into too much, I have one more of these presentations to go through. Um, reduced financial stress, I'm not sure when that's going to happen. <laughs> Soon, hopefully. Uh, and obviously newer opportunities, new passion. Uh, 2019 sucked, it was a brutal, brutal farming year, but it really is uh, what's the saying? Uh, you want to make it small changes, change the way you do things. You want to make big changes, change the way you see things. That is truly, and I'm going to steal this from Gabe Brown. Gabe always said, I used to get up conventionally farming and think, what can I kill? Is it a pest? Is it a, is it a fungus? Is it a weed? Whereas now the focus is, how can I incorporate more life on my farm, more resiliency, uh, and you're going to be, you know, better, uh, better suited to grow healthier plants. Challenges, obviously, whoop, whoops, shit, there we go. Uh, <laughs> the, the weeds is definitely an issue. It depends on your perception of weeds. Um, I like to tell people weeds is just the soil expressing itself with the, with the seeds that it, it knows it's going to repair itself more quickly. Uh, my neighbors don't think of it that way, and it does kind of suck, but it's just one of the things we have to live with. Uh, not enough research, which I think we've hammered home. Um, definitely management intense, without a doubt. Um, and equipment. Um, things like seed separation and drills and whatnot. 
the new ideas that we're doing on the farm, um, water infiltration, I would say, is the easiest thing you can do on your farm to gauge how healthy or how resilient your soil is. If you can infiltrate water, it means you have pore space. If you have pore space, it means you have a home for biology. You have, uh, uh, you can store water. Um, for anybody who's interested, that is a uh, seven-inch tube from an old auger, and I welded handles on, and I hammered in the ground and and calculate an inch of water. It is invaluable. That thing I have used most spring. I'm out in every single field, and uh, it's it's very 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 interesting. Uh, we do melted urea. If, if somebody's heard it or wants some more information, I won't talk about it now. But you can chat with me about it. Obviously, we're intercropping. We start using crystal green foss, which is a non-water soluble foss, not 1152, which, in my personal opinion, is completely useless now. We use uh, folic acid or, or humic acid. Trying our best to reduce glyphosate, but I'm finding that's harder than quitting smoking, which I'm also not good at. Uh, we don't use any fungicide at all and zero pesticide. And that's the first for the last two. That's the first year um, we've done that. But if we're trying to increase the fungal biomass in our soils, it's really, really hard to do if you're spraying fungicide three times a year. I'll just go through this quickly on uh, infiltration rates, if people, if you're not familiar with it. So the till canola stubble, this is exactly what I found in my research with water infiltration. One inch is an hour. I'm sure to a lot of people that haven't done infiltration rates, that is alarming. The second inch was between 12 and 16 hours. I had to go to bed before the water went away. Um, and then this is some of my pride and joy, the full season cover. You can just see the difference, two inches in 35 minutes. The perennial relay, which is just uh, a cereal underseeded with uh, legume, is uh, 38 minutes. And then the most interesting, the corn vetch. I think it, it has a lot to do with uh, balancing the carbon to nitrogen and creating pore space. But it was uh, the best two inches of, of water in 22 minutes. Uh, these are our intercrops peas, canola, beans, millet. That's a photo of the beans and millet. Uh, for organic producers out there, if you haven't heard of this, um, I think there's lots of opportunity with uh, beans and millet for organic production. Uh, the oats vetch, that's what I'm going to get to next, and then obviously the corn vetch. If you're grazing corn or combining corn and have cows, vetch works so good. It's glyphosate resistant. You can have clean fields and uh, high protein, palatable biomass. It makes so much, so much sense if you have livestock. Uh, these are just the influence, influencers that I, I made a list in case people were interested. Um, but I'm going to go through uh, one more thing. Um, do the, the other presentation? I'll go through it quick. So James, who was talking um, earlier about getting a community together, presented me with this idea. Um, uh, growing uh, vetch at a higher rate with oats in an attempt to reduce input costs and also um, have a decent oat yield, but also uh, have a viable feed source, um, which is the oat vetch straw uh, to feed the cows. So I'll just buzz through this quick. Um, oat vetch, this is the idea. So oats under seeded to uh, vetch and perennial ryegrass, I added as well, uh, an attempt to reduce costs, provide viable feed source, like I said, keep a living root, grazing, and I don't have notes, so I'm not sure what the last one is. Um, this is the crop. We used a pre-seed herbicide, not glyphosate, because I was done with glyphosate, but I'm finding that's really hard to do. Um, so we sowed 55 pounds of oats, 12 pounds of etch, 5 pounds of perennial ryegrass, and we did uh, 30 pounds of N, and then we did trials of 60, 45, and 0. So observation, we had good rain early in the spring, the vetch was incredibly slow, the oats jumped ahead, um, there was some millet wild oat pressure. I think next year we will up our seeding rate to probably 90 pounds of oats and try and get some more early competition. Um, the vetch re reached the top of the oat canopy in, in August when the oats were starting to turn, which I think uh, worked out pretty good timing wise. And the vetch needs moisture. The reason I included this photo is because on one side of the flag, uh, there's zero nitrogen, and the other side there's 30 pounds. But kind of what I wanted to show is you cannot tell which is which. Small amount of, of uh, photosynthesizing batch that was low in the canopy seemed to, to uh, 
provide adequate enough uh, nitrogen for the oats. And this is what I mean. This, so vetch is, if for those people that haven't done anything with vetch, vetch is, um, it's an opportunist for sunlight. It eventually does head up the oat canopy once the oats have, uh, like once the oats have uh, matured and set seed. But for the time being, they just hang out low in the canopy, gathering up any bit of sunlight that they can. Um, and obviously, they're, they're one of the best nitrogen fixators that we have. Um, so at this point, they are of no competition to the oats. They're just providing nitrogen to the system. They're not. Uh, they're not stealing sunlight or, uh, or many nutrients from the oats, a little bit of moisture. So this was about the middle of July, end of July. So this is uh, the start of August. So you can see the purple flowers, the oats are starting to turn. You can see the vetch. And at this point in the experiment, I thought the vetch is going to do nothing. There is no vetch out there enough to make viable feed source. And then it started to rain. Oh, sorry, damn it. <laughs> I should have practiced. Uh, this is uh, this is just what it looks uh, horizontally. So you can see the prairie ryegrass down there hanging out, capturing sunlight low. The vetch is stretched out to the top of the oat canopy, and these oats are, are ready to combine. So you kind of you kind of see the spectrum of how the sunlight is used with with these three crops. And then it started to rain, and this is what it turned into. An absolute the vetch just took off unbelievably. Um, and I know what everyone's thinking, because what everyone asks is, how the hell do you come like that? Yeah, it was, uh, it was, <laughs> it was wild. Oof, look at that. Uh, uh, I tell people that you need two things, patience and cannabis. <laughs> no, but it actually, to be honest, I wouldn't want to go into that with a rotary combine, but it combine, excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, we had a little bit of problems with the vetch catching on the side of the header, but as long as you figure out which direction the vetch is laying, you go that direction in the opposite, and it went through just super. Like, we put that through with a 30-foot header on a 9600 at three miles an hour. It was just like doing monocrop uh, boats. So th that's what the bales looked like. Um, you can, that was a vetch spot that I went through with the baler, and it, it's such a bind. Pick up, picked everything up. So that was October 9th. That's October 10th. We only got 30 acres done out of a quarter section. Um, but something interesting that we had so much snow, we couldn't get access our haystacks. So what we had was oat vetch. And these are the heifers grazing. So you can see that that's the feed that's available. And I, I uh, sent away feed samples, hoping that they'd be back in time for this. But I'm going to take a ballpark and say that's somewhere between 100 and 120 relative feed value in feed. The cows cleaned it up totally, and they're the, the, the best estimators of how quality the feed is, and that was gone. Um, so this is just, I just scratched this down a while ago. I'm hoping to update it this winter. But the idea is monocrop oats, if you're getting 125 bushels at three bucks, your gross revenue is 375. With the oat batch, if you have the livestock to add value. Um, I lowered the, the oat rates down to 100 bushels, which is roughly what we were getting on the stuff before the snowfall. We're get, definitely getting 3,000 pounds of forage at seven cents, which I don't know where you're finding seven cent hay these days, but you can add an extra $200 an acre while reducing costs is, uh, is kind of the idea. Um, and you've got more grass revenue to play with and hopefully less risk. Um, I think that's it. So yeah, I guess we will answer questions. Thank you very much.